Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. It's a real pleasure to have you join us. I, I have to say a slight sneaky admiration for those of you if you are listening very late at night, but also a degree of sympathy that an evening should bring you to my webinar rather than something more interesting wherever you happen to be. Uh, and also the joy of webinar, of course, is that you can't actually uh, see us directly, this being a typical Glasgow spring afternoon in May. We're in our Bermuda shorts and t-shirts with our shades on, so you can use your imagination, and I hope that that will give you something exciting to hang on to when we delve into the depths of thinking a little bit more about effective and sustainable treatment of rheumatoid, which is uh, many of you are, are probably aware is a subject of extraordinary importance and certainly to investigators like myself is a, is a real passion. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes is, is try and contextualize stratified medicine in, 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 in rheumatoid arthritis. We're going to first of all spend a little time thinking about the, the current approaches to the treatment of rheumatoid, why we do what we currently do, how we do what we currently do. And as we review the, those areas, we're going to think a little bit on where the unanswered questions reside. And then what I'm going to do is, is turn to the future, briefly uh, outline the kinds of areas in which people are making new medicines for the treatment of this disease, and then try and lay out, if you like, a framework upon which we could build true biomarker-driven stratification. Um, but I, I thought maybe before we started, it might be interesting just to pull a quick question, just to, first of all, to get your, your mouse fingers on the go at this time of whatever time of day it happens to be, and you should see shortly a, a question in front of you that will, uh, I hope, at least engender some response. Andrew, back to you. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, we certainly do have a poll question here for the audience, and you can vote on this as an attendee by clicking on your screen. The question that we have, to what extent do you believe there is value in using biomarkers to personalize rheumatoid arthritis medicine? Uh, and your options, strongly believe, somewhat believe, you're not sure, somewhat disbelieve, or strongly disbelieve. Again, that question, to what extent do you believe there is value in using biomarkers to personalize rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis medicine? Looks like most of you have voted at this point, so I'm going to close the poll now and share the results with you. And there we have it. It looks like the majority of you, 66% uh, of you said that you strongly believe, 29% uh, somewhat believe, and 4% of you were not sure, 1% of you said somewhat disbelieve. And with that, Ian, I'll hand it back to you. Well, thanks very much indeed. Uh, it's lovely to know that you're speaking to a group of people who already believe that the subject matter is important. I have to say, if there had been 90% in group five there, I would have been a deeply anxious man at the moment, but there we go. So I suppose what we're really trying to do is to bring one or two um, uh, either agnostics or, 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 or unbelievers into the fold. Um, Actually, I have a lot of respect for the view because the, the, the concept that we're there yet is occasionally migrating into our literature. And in fact, I think this is very much a work in progress. Rather like cancer, the, 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 the rheumatoid syndrome that we now recognize is a sequence of events. Um, I think the concept of a single hit hypothesis is pretty much gone from the modern literature. And what I've depicted in this screen is a, is a series of events. I want you just to start at the top of the screen. Um, you're looking here at a, a susceptible genome, which is epigenetically modified, and then in, in, insulted by a, a variety of environmental in, uh, factors. So just first of all, a comment on the susceptibility genome. There are actually, uh, the, the, the most recent data published by Okada and colleagues in in nature just uh, two to three months ago. We, we have more than a, a hundred uh, SNPs associated with rheumatoid risk, and uh, the, the precise number of genes that they're telling us about is a little less clear. There are a variety of epigenetic factors that impinge on how those genes function, and the, the, the most common environmental insults we, we, we've come to recognize are first and foremost smoking. Uh, particularly if you have the HLA-DR40104 shared epitope, uh, one of the strongest um, risk factors for, uh, for rheumatoid at the genetic level, you, you're 
odds ratio for developing disease is in the order of 70 or 80 fold increased, which is really a very remarkable environmental genetic interaction. But a combination of that or potentially an alteration in the, in the microbiome, very interesting work from New York recently suggesting over-representation of uh, a Prevotella species in, uh, in the gut of people with very early rheumatoid arthritis. The idea that the, the microbiome perturbs immune regulation or indeed vice versa and leading to what in the end becomes manifest as breach of tolerance. So for the non-immunologists in the, in the webinar, breach of tolerance defines that state when someone who is normally able to recognize their own tissues and not respond to them, deliberately not respond, suddenly becomes susceptible and vulnerable to making responses. And, and by that route, we could start to make immune responses against our own proteins, our own glycolipids, and the like.